I really want to thank uh, the entire uh, team at the Amen Melanoma program for giving me this opportunity to be here and participate in the symposium. And I hope uh, that I'm able to increase awareness and educate all the people who have joined the program today about uh, some of the latest advances in skin cancer. So let me share my slide first and then again, thank you, Dr. Beasley for introdu introducing me. Uh, I'm an associate professor here at Duke. Uh, my primary area of focus is head and neck uh, squamous cell carcinomas and I also am uh, currently developing the squamous cell, uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma program uh, at, at Duke uh, where I'm seeing a, a lot of these patients that are being sent to us. Um, again, I, I thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, I'm only going to talk about things that have been approved by the FDA with just a brief mention of some of the clinical trials. Uh, again, whenever we talk about any cancer, we have to always start with the epidemiology. And this is a very simple uh, way of presenting the incidence uh, of uh, skin cancers. Uh, we see that uh, the most common kinds of type of skin cancer is basal cell, uh, while squamous cell carcinoma and related cancers comprise about 17 to 20% of all the skin cancers that are diagnosed. Uh, and as you can see on, in the graph on the right side is that both basal cell and squamous cell, which are the mo two most common, uh, their incidence due to their unique nature of uh, the pathogenesis keeps increasing with time, both in men and women. And what we see is that the incidence keeps on increasing almost up to the age of um, 85 to 90 years before it really starts to fall. And even then the fall is a slow one. Um, so it's very high uh, likelihood that people, especially uh, people who have fair skin and live in sunny uh, areas are going to uh, you know, experience or be diagnosed with at least one cutaneous squamous cell in their lifetime. So, so what that tells us is that you know, the as uh, we see, you're going to see lots and lots of uh, these skin cancers, especially the basal cell and squamous cell. And more and more of these patients are going to be seen in an older uh, age and population. Uh, we have to review some of the risk factors associated. Now, risk factors can be divided for the squamous cell, can be divided into three parts, environmental, internal, and others. In the environmental, which is the most common, is the sun exposure especially the UV radiation part of the sun. So pay people who live in places like Florida or Southern California who are exposed to sun and go out on the beach a lot are going to be at a higher risk of getting these uh, squamous cells. Uh, and then we have things like uh, PUVA therapy, uh, tanning beds are a big source of uh, squamous cell carcinomas. And then we have exposure to certain drugs and chemicals like arsenic, polycyclic, aromatic hydrocarbons, and ionizing radiation. A second group of population that I see very frequently are these patients who have some kind of an immune suppression, uh, either due to inherent deficiencies in the immune system. And then Duke being a solid organ transplant center, we have a lot of these organ transplant uh, recipients who develop a very aggressive skin cancers. Uh, we, this was this is very very hard to treat, but recently we have had quite a few advances in this field, and I'm going to discuss that at, uh, later in the talk. And then last, we have patients who have some um, sort of genetic alterations, like xeroderma pigmentosum, is a big cause of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. And then we also have uh, infections like HPV, especially the 6, 11, 16, and 18, which are implicated in the development of cutaneous SCC. Just a quick pathology pathology review. We it passes through the stage of uh, damage through UVR and then transitions to a pre-malignant cell stage, followed by carcinoma in C2 and then invasive cutaneous SCC. Now, among the latest advances uh, advances that we see in cutaneous squamous cell these days is the increased uh, identification and. Uh, you know, recognition of these mutations uh, and markers in the genetic alteration, which are leading to increased incidences of these cutaneous SCCs. Uh, one of the main implications also is that some of these uh, mutations are amenable to targeting by drugs. And so it's important to look for these to offer better treatment options for our patients. This lists a lot of the stuff that we see 
but uh, what we see commonly here is that TP53, CDK, and 2A, these are tumor suppressor genes, and we see a lot of cutaneous STCs uh, who have these mutations, which are the driver mutations for them. Then we also find things like the KN, STRN, and the CARD11. These are more specifically associated with uh, exposure to the UV rays. And then one of the main things also to look at is the EGFR. Uh, EGFR is a is dysregulated in a lot of cutaneous STCs, and that also provides us with a target to treat these cancers. Whenever we are talking about squamous cell, it's also important to look at some of the risk factors which help us to identify which patients are going to do better, who are going to do worse. And we have a whole list of stuff that we are going to look at, which, which helps us to prognosticate these patients, which also helps us to determine how best to treat them and prevent relapses. So if you see here, poor, poorly differentiated forms which have lost their primary differentiation are going to be much more aggressive with a three times larger, uh, higher incidence of uh, local recurrence, twice uh, incidence of metastasis. Then depth of invasion of the primary tumor is a big factor in how patients are going to do. Any depth more than two millimeters is a 10 times more likelihood of local recurrence and 10 or 11 times more likelihood of metastatic, metastatic disease. Similarly, we have things like uh, PNI and LVI, which are very high risk factors for progression of disease and especially local recurrence and P LVI for metastatic disease. Sometimes the location of the tumor itself makes it high risk, especially in the temple, ear, and the lip areas. And as expected, larger tumors are going to do worse. And tumors arising from scars are also going to be much more aggressive in terms of how they spread and metastasize to the body. This gives us a very broad idea. The cutaneous uh, squamous cell treatment is a multidisciplinary approach. There is always going to be involvement of the dermatology team, the surgical oncologist, radiation, and the medical oncologist. So it's a very complex decision-making process. And at Duke, we have a multidisciplinary tumor board where tough cases or complex cases are reviewed uh, and input from uh, all the possible uh, team members which, which are involved in the care of these patients are, are used. Uh, and that is where a lot of these decisions are made to proceed with either surgery or radiation or do new adjuvant immunotherapy, which, has, which is one of the newer stuff and things that have emerged in cutaneous squamous cell. So because I am a medical oncologist, so I'm going to concentrate more on systemic th therapy options for squamous cell carcinoma, which is incurable by surgery or radiation. Historically, chemotherapy was used for a very long time. Uh, it was very toxic, um, lots of side effects, uh, nobody liked it. Then we uh, made some advances and EGFR-based targeted therapy uh, came along, which was better tolerated and had better responses till finally about five, seven years ago, we have seen the advent of immunotherapy in squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, which has really revolutionized uh, the therapy of uh, incurable cutaneous squamous cell and li literally it has um, you know, outdated chemo and EGFR-based therapies, and we hardly do that anymore. So my, most, a lot of the talk that we are going to talk about is going to look at immunotherapy and how it has enabled us to treat this cutaneous, aggressive cutaneous squamous cells in a more efficient and manner. Now, I'm sure that all of us here must have heard about uh, semiplimab, this is a PD-1 blocker, which is approved currently for the use of uh, for the use of for treatment of patients with incurable uh, cutaneous squamous cell. Just a brief outline of how it works. Uh, so we have tumor cells and T cells. T cells are, are are immune cells which help us to remove tumor cells uh, from our body. They have these targets called PD-1 on the T cells and PD-L1 uh, on the tumor cells, and when these interact, uh, there is a chain reaction which in which neutralizes the T cells and makes them non-functional. The semiplimab is a monoclonal antibody. It binds to PD-1, which is present on the T cell, and interrupts this interaction of PD-L1 and PD-1, and that keeps the T cells active and reactivates their tum anti-tumor responses. Uh, so the one of the first studies that came out 
looking at PD-1 blockade was uh, through Dr. McDen and uh, his team uh, who looked at the role of PD-1 blockade with semiplumab in advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. It was a fairly large study for cutaneous squamous cell. Uh, it was done in two phases uh, involving about 26 patients in the phase one part and 59 patients in phase two. All of these patients had um, pre previously been treated and had no really good treatment options for them. Uh, about, if you look at it, at, at it about 30% patients in the first cohort and 76% Patients in the next um, in the second cohort had metastatic disease. So these are basically advanced disease patients with a lot of disease burden and had failed in conventional therapy. And the results were truly, um, you know, eye opening. This looks at the uh, plot of uh, responses in these patients, and you see these are the patients who have responded with blue showing stable disease, and the purple ones showing complete and partial responses. Uh, and the, the response rate was very, very high, very encouraging. And uh, what we saw was that at least 50% of patients in the first phase and 41% of patients in the second phase had partial response, which, uh, which means that the tumor shrunk. Some of them also had a complete response, which means the tumor was not visible anymore. Uh, only about 12% patients in the first cohort and 19% patients in the second cohort had progression. So the overall disease control rate was in the range of about 80%, which was very, very high for any uh, squamous cell cancer, uh, cutaneous squamous cell study. This was followed with a an updated uh, analysis of their data, which again showed that the, the responses were very, very durable. Uh, long-term patients who get this treatment were able to maintain their uh, response to treatment for a long time. Um, and this is, again, this study is also uh, something that came out immediately after that, which showed real world data of responses to immunotherapy in cutaneous squamous cell. Again, what we see here is that patients who are younger <clears throat> are going to do better, um, while older folks are going to do a little, uh, a little bit worse. Another startling thing in this study also is that uh, when we treat patients who are immune suppressed or immune competent, their uh, you know survival with immune therapy is almost the same. So that opened the, this study actually opened our eyes that we could treat patients who are immunocompromised also with semiplumab. And so so that so that study basically made semiplumab the standard of care for patients with locally advanced incurable cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So again, the next step was uh, how do we help the patients who have large tumors, which are still resectable? And so the concept of new adjuvant semiplumab was used. Uh, there was this big trial by Dr. Gross, uh, and they looked at stage two and to stage four cutaneous squamous cells, which were not metastatic. We were still surgical candidates. And to treat them with uh, semiplumab, and they had about 70, uh, these 79 patients, uh, out of which vast 46% um, had stage four disease, 48% uh, had stage three disease. They all get, got three cycles of semiplumab, three weeks apart, and then they were evaluated for surgical resection. And again, the responses were outstanding. Uh, you know, we, we saw that about, <coughs> sorry, on pathology after surgery, about 51% of patients had pathological complete response, which means that they did not have any tumor left. And then they also had another um, criteria, which is which was called the pathological major response, which were, which means that less than 10% tumor is left behind. And another 13% patients fell in that category. So, which basically showed us that about 65 to 70% of patients had a great response to treatment. Um, and they, they were some of these candidates could avoid adjuvant therapy like radiation. And looking at the adverse event profile, it was very well tolerated with three uh, doses, hardly anything, any significant side effects was, was seen in these patients. So currently, uh, you know, new adjuvant therapy with semiplumab has become a, the, a big uh, new trend and uh, emerging standard of care for patients with advanced disease who are surgical candidates, but whose surgery is expected to be very difficult or has have a lot of morbidity 
Uh, and we also have multiple clinical trials here at Duke where we are looking at different combinations as new adjuvant for these patients to help them uh, help the surgery become um, more less challenging. Uh, another area where we see a lot of cutaneous squamous cell is the immunocompromised patients. And this is a very rough uh, study, uh, idea which tells us that, you know, as patients, uh, especially, this looked at uh, foiled organ transplant patients, as I told you earlier, Duke is a big center for uh, uh, organ transplant. We have a, a lot of patients who have had kidney transplants and we can see over time, these patients are due to their chronic immune suppression, uh, they they have a 65 to 250 fold increase in squamous cell carcinoma. And these squamous cell carcinomas in these solid organ transplant patients are the most aggressive types where, and they are going to be found in areas such as the head and neck where surgeries are very, very morbid. Uh, and so, and again, whenever we use semiplimab, we also have a very uh, high concern for organ rejection in these patients and which, which may can it's by itself be life-threatening so these these are immune compromised patients very challenging to treat uh, and there's a lot of concern for toxicity and organ rejection but we have some encouraging data which came out of uh, dana farber uh, last year by my colleague dr hannah and his team and so what they did was they took about 12 renal transplant patients uh, who had metastatic advanced cutaneous SEC. Uh, they were given semiplimab once every 21 days, and their immune suppression was changed to serolimus, and they had a special uh, dose of uh, steroid regimen to help uh, ma maintain their immu immune suppression. And what we found was a very, very small study, but the results were very encouraging. They, they, they were able to show a 46% uh, response rate with tumor shrinkage in these patients. And the best part was that these patients had zero graft rejection. So they were able to protect the kidneys as well as bring about good responses with these patients. So as of today, when I, uh, most of the patients that I see who have immune compromise due to organ transplant and have these aggressive cutaneous SECs, uh, the contract study regimen is what we are using. And uh, our data itself shows that uh, these responses are also going to be seen in the real world. <clears throat> now going to the next step. So again, what, what are the next steps that are having or what are being done in cutaneous squamous cell? So we are looking at a lot of biomarkers uh, to see how we can make these therapeutic options better. We are looking at things like circulating tumor DNA and the tumor microenvironment to see which patients are going to respond better to immunotherapy and who are not. We are also looking at omics te uh, technology like genomics, uh, improvement in clinical pathological features, and again, and also newer drugs and newer drug delivery mechanisms are being looked into. So the future uh, is very, very encouraging for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. This gives us a list of some of the most uh, important clinical trials that are going on uh, with using immunotherapy in various settings. Some of them are a high risk, some of them are for advanced disease. We also have a lot of new adjuvant studies using different combinations. Um, so, you know, as a cutaneous squamous uh, cell a medical oncologist, uh, I'm very, very, um, and you know, happy and we are very optimistic that we are going to be able to get more and improved and better treatment options for our patients. So with that, I'm going, I think I'm almost at time. So I'm going to conclude and I will let Dr. Beasley uh, take over. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have questions at the end.